Well, this morning we are continuing this series we're doing all summer long where we're talking about some different ways to carry out this mission that Jesus Christ himself gave to the church where he said, go, right? As he says in Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples go, which in the original language that was written in, it's a command. Like for you military guys, you know, if someone who outranks you says, go, bring me slippers or whatever, you don't argue, you just You just go, right? It's like, yeah, yes, sir. That's the idea. Jesus says, you go, every Christian, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Go tell people the good news, in other words, of what Jesus did for them, what he did to save them, and this hope they can have that you only find in Christ. And for those who accept it, take them under your wing. He says, make a disciple, not just make a convert, make a disciple. Take them under your wing. Show them what it means to follow Jesus day by day. Show them what it means to be his. And as you do, Jesus says, I promise, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Sometimes we quote that verse, God is with me. Well, time out. In context, he's saying, as you're making disciples, I'll be with you. It's his mission for every follower. Because we do have the good news this world desperately needs, right? That as John 3, 16, the famous verse says. Again, if you memorize this before the end of the series, we have a special treat for you. But no one's done it yet, so see if you can memorize it. God, this is the entire gospel in one verse. It says, God so loved the world. He loved you and me and everyone on this planet so much, it says, that he gave His one and only son. Notice it doesn't say he he sent him so you'd have to earn something. No, it's his gift. He gave you a gift. He gave you his only son, Jesus. He loved us so much. 2,000 years ago, he he put skin on, basically. He said, I will come to earth, live a perfect life, and then offer to trade you records. Everything you've ever done you feel guilt or shame for, I'll take the punishment for it. I'll take the responsibility for it. You take my perfect record because I just love you that much. That's what the cross is about. It's God in human form dying our spiritual death penalty, basically, for all the stuff we've done wrong God could punish us for. He goes, I'll take it on myself so you don't have to, right? And he rises from the dead three days later. So that whoever believes, whoever puts their trust in him, this idea of, like, if you're sitting down, like, it's not just believing the stool is there. It's like, no, I'm actually going to put everything I have on this to prove I believe this stool will hold me up. That's what this word means. It's this idea of trusting something to the point where you act on it. So whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. Which, as we've said, isn't just about life after death. It's about life during life, having peace and hope and joy and all these things right now that you don't find anywhere else. A changed heart that, that's just bent in a different direction than it naturally wants to be. All in this relationship with God through Jesus. It's the good news the world needs. Because when you really get it, it changes literally everything. That's why so many of us are here. That's why I'm standing here right now. It occurred to me it was 20 years ago I think a week and a half ago that I decided to read this little book about Jesus as a teenager that changed everything for me. I wouldn't be here right now if at 16 years old I hadn't read this little book that we actually have at the back called Living in Christ. That's why we have them, because I figured, hey, if it can change this messed up guy, it'll help you too. But that's the gospel, right? It's an awesome thing. And as we've been saying all summer, there are so many different ways we can tell people that too. Sometimes we think of evangelism. We think of I have to have a big stadium event or hold a sign and yell at people. No, that's not even necessarily biblical. You can share Jesus with acts of kindness. Man, our culture is so self-focused. When you consistently are selfless, people notice after a while and wonder, what is it with you? You can tell him, it's Jesus. He, he changed my life. You can do it relationally, just in the relationships you already have. Watch for opportunities to point people to God in conversation. You can do it testimonially, just a fancy word for share your story. How has Jesus changed your life? You know? Maybe you love the apologetics approach we'll plan to cover next week where it's more like logic and reason and history and can you prove God exists? Yes, we can. We will do it next Sunday. Don't miss it. Can you prove Jesus rose from the dead? Yes, we can. We'll do it next Sunday and we'll do both and talk about it in under 30 minutes. Not that hard. Apologetics. Or maybe the confrontational style will be your favorite where you just confront people lovingly. Hey, do you know Jesus? Do you you know about him? Can I tell you about him? Or maybe your favorite will be the one we're doing today which in my opinion is the easiest one, right? We, we said the testimonial one is one of the most powerful. The relational one is good acts of kindness. But this is the easiest one in my opinion. And that's called the invitational style. 
Because what this one is about is you just invite people to places where they can personally connect with Jesus, right? Not that hard. See, a great example of that here in John 4, all the way back 2,000 years ago, with a woman Jesus meets at a well, okay? Let's check it out. John chapter 4, starting in verse 4 this morning. Check it out with me there. It says this. It says, now Jesus had to go through Samaria, which stop right there for a second because that's a whole sermon by itself, okay? At that time in history, Jewish people like Jesus and his disciples and Samaritan people that lived in Samaria hated each other. I mean, you want to talk about racism? This was major racism. This was, let me ruin your worship service for you. Let me do whatever I can to make your life miserable. They hated each other. You can look up all the history if you want to, but racism at its worst, okay? But as Pastor Rick Warren says so well, he says, you know, God has never made a person he doesn't love. And race was actually his idea. And if you read the Bible, you find out racial reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel. How you and I treat other people matters deeply to God. As God even says repeatedly in the Bible, like 2 Chronicles 19.7 says, The Lord our God does not tolerate perverted justice, partiality, or the taking of bribes. Okay, so if you have God with skin on walking into the heart of racism, what might he do? Let's find out. This is pretty awesome. Watch this. Verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. That's a reference to some Old Testament stories in the book of Genesis. You can read those later too. But verse 6, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Look at this, verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, the drama starts immediately. <laughs> no, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you possibly ask me for a drink? Because Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water are you greater than our father Jacob? Oh, let's get in the race wars. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, well, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Then as Jesus loves to do, he goes right to the heart. This ain't about water. <laughs> Verse 16, he told her, go, call your husband and, and then come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Part of me wonders how many times this woman almost dropped her jar of water in this conversation, you know, just out of shock, like, what is this? How, how, how do you know? Right? Um, which, by the way, I know even by our standards of Hollywood today, five times married and divorced is a lot, right? But before you're tempted to think, man, this lady needs to learn how to commit. Come on, lady, quit jumping around. Back up and remember, this isn't 2016 America, okay? This is first century Palestine. They didn't have the women's rights, the divorce laws, and all that that we have. This most likely means if she's been married and divorced five times, it means she was married and rejected five times. She was married to five different guys who all kicked her to the curb because none of them liked her in the end. And now she's with guy number six without even the possible security that came with marriage for a woman back then. So she's super desperate. So this isn't a woman to condemn and judge and like, get it up together, hussy. That, that's not the deal. This is a woman to be immensely sorry for, which I'm thinking Jesus was. And where he's taken her with the conversation kind of proves that. So she, she starts to see it here. Verse 19, look at that. She says, okay, so sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. Okay, fine, I get it. But I don't want to talk about me. You ever know someone like that? I don't want to talk about my issues. Uh-uh. So let's change it to the hot topic of racism. Let's get back to that. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place we have to worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. Let's stay on the right topic. He says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you'll worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. It's not going to matter what race you are. Okay, you Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But, but get this, a time is coming and has actually now come when the true worshipers, Samaritan, Jewish, or whatever you are, the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Then she tries to just shut the conversation down and change the stuff. Well, you know what? I know that the Messiah, the Christ, is coming. When he gets here, he'll explain it. And she's goes, <laughs> got something cool to tell you. Um, I, the one speaking to you, I'm actually him. Bam. All right. Now watch this. Verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Though I wouldn't be surprised if they were dying to ask. <laughs> it's like, how can you talk to her? Okay. Verse 28. Watch this. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? If you ever feel like you don't get it with Jesus, just read about his disciples. They will give you so much comfort. They never got it till the end. Okay, what is he talking about? Um, He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's the answer to your question you're afraid to ask. Why is he talking with her? Why are we in Samaria with all these ugly, icky people? I'm here to do God's work. This is part of it, right? Don't you have a saying, it's still four months till the harvest, he says? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. In other words, there's people that need our message. Even these guys that you might be afraid to talk to, they need our message right? Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so the sower and reaper may be glad together. He's just using a farming analogy, saying, man, it is time to share this message. People are just waiting for it. You need to get out there. Thus the saying, one sows and other reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you haven't worked for. Others have done the hard work. They prepared all this, and then you've reaped the benefits of their labor. Lesson moment. All right, back to the lady. Look at this. Many of the Samaritans, verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, Because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And here's the key. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard it for ourselves, and we know this man really is the Savior of the world. So catch what happened there, right? So first there's this broken, hurting woman who encounters Jesus, right? And then he changes her life, okay? And then third, she goes and invites more people to meet Jesus too, and they accept the invitation, and their lives get changed too. And that is all there is to the invitational evangelism, just inviting people to a place where you know they'll hear about Jesus and what he can do in their lives. When you're coming to SCC on a Sunday, invite someone to come with you, even if you're late or it's smoky or you live 800 miles away. You know, whatever, invite someone to come with you. You can, we just got some brand new invite cards made this week, and I think they're really cool. They're sort of ugly, but that's part of the point. Um, And it just, on the front, just says different, because Amy and I have visited a few churches around here, and they're not bad, but what hit us is we really do have something different. I mean, even, well, it's contemporary like others. Yeah, but we still just have something different. So I was like, okay, different. And you open it up, and there's a cool guitar and a cup of coffee, and it's our little saying that we use. It's like church for people who don't like church. Okay, and then people go, <laughs> every time I say that to someone, they laugh. Even if they're a hardened atheist, they think that's hilarious. So I'm like, cool. And then you're invited, and then our stuff, and then a map on the back. Take an invite card with you. Just leave it, you know, give it to someone. Use our pens even. We get the cool ones on purpose, you know. They're not just for you. We get the cool ones with our website, so you can use these as invitations. I carry three or four with me around at the aquarium all the time because someone always ends up needing a pen. Do you have a pen? Yeah, here. Hey, why don't you keep it? Oh, oh, this is for your church. Yeah, you should come sometime. It's that easy. They're cool pens. If you give someone a lame pen, they're like, thanks. No, I don't want it. You know, but you got a cool pen, then they'll keep it and use it. I see coworkers using these for months because they think they're cool. Use the pens. Take them with you. Don't clean us out, but do take a handful, you know, and use them. They're good invitations. Or if you happen to go somewhere else, like you're going to a concert, Christian concert, or, or some other, like, Harvest Crusade thing, or some other good Christian event that could be a good connection point for people. Now, there's the key, not a bad connection point. Some Christian events are a little too Christian. You know, Michael Jr. jokes about people being oversaved, the comedian, if you've seen him. Pick events wisely. But if it's a good connection point, invite someone to come with you to that too. If you're coming to one of our house churches this fall, invite someone to come with you to that. It's a great connection point. Free food works. Or some other outreach we do, like the golf tournament. I mean, that's why we do these things, like the golf tournament, is because we want to connect people to Jesus, right? So bring them. That's why we do the half price thing. 
Um, and again, golfers, wait till you see how we're going to spoil people. I'm not going to tell you, but it's going to be awesome. And show them what Jesus looks like by how you play, how you interact. Um, the invitational style can also look like just inviting someone to listen to Christian music with you. A friend of mine uh, who's a Christian, been a Christian for a number of years, just told me a couple weeks ago that actually Christian music was a huge stepping stone for him coming to know Jesus. He said long ago when he was a non-Christian, he was going somewhere with a friend who was a Christian, and the friend goes, oh, you got to listen to these guys while they're driving in the car. And he pops in this cassette tape, if you even remember what those are, of this band called DC Talk, some of you may have heard of when they were kind of still new. And uh, my, my friend is listening to this, and he goes, that's pretty good. And he said, that was such a seed in my life. Just listening to DC talk, driving down the road, God started working on me with that music. You never know, man. Tra change the stations. If you're in like Best Buy and they have radios on, change them to K-Love. I don't know, whatever. But you never know. Use music. It can be a powerful thing. Invitational style can also look like leaving a track, one of our little how to, what Jesus is about uh, booklets or one of our invite cards. Leave it with a tip at a restaurant. But if you do that, okay, hear me. If you've never been a waiter or waitress, some of you have, but if you've never been a waiter or waitress, you need to know two things if you're going to leave a track or a card with a, with a tip at a restaurant, okay? First of all, be sure you're nice to the waiter the entire time, okay? This is something new I've learned since doing my third job now as a waiter at the aquarium with night events. Some people, you take their plate, and they're like, thank you so much. And they're, they're paying big money for these night events. Like, thank you. Oh, here, let me help you. Other people are just like, mm -hmm, and keep talking. And I'm like, thanks. That makes me feel welcome. But if you're going to leave something that says, hey, come to my church to learn about Jesus, don't be a jerk. <laughs> because they're going to look at this and go, oh, there's more like you? No, thanks. Okay, you know, you want them to go, oh, there's more like you. Cool, where? You know, don't be a jerk. Be nice to them the whole time, even if they mess up your order. Be nice. Being a waiter gives me a very different perspective. Amy and I ate at one of our favorite restaurants yesterday, and it's, it's usually very good. And my fork had like a little booger or something on it, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. So they bring another fork sometimes with your food, and so I'm like, I'm just going to leave this here and not complain, and let's just move on with life. It's cool. It's not a big deal. I have another fork, right? You don't have to make a big deal out of everything. Be nice to them the whole time. And number two, be sure you leave a good tip. <laughs> Seriously, I have known of Christians that go, oh, I'll leave this instead of a tip. Guess where that's going to go? Straight to the trash, okay? Or the fireplace if there's one nearby in the restaurant, okay? As much as I love making 10 bucks an hour doing waitering, it's the tips that pay for Amy and me to live where we live and, you know, buy food. It's the tips that we depend on. And that's how it is for waitresses, right? Hourly pay is nice. It's leave a good tip. Let them know, hey, I care about you as a human being. So be nice and leave a good tip if you're going to leave a track. And then as a waiter, I'll go, okay. You cared about me personally. You cared about my life beyond this. You paid for me to survive. Maybe I'll listen to what you have to say. Maybe I'll check out your church, right? Do it right. Leave tracks, change radio stations, give pens. Um, if you want to look it up online, there's also an organization called the Pocket Testament League. And what they do is they make little Gospels of John with all sorts of cool covers, like really cool eye-catching covers. They'll have like a dog with his tongue out like flying through the air, and they'll go, hey, missing something in the air, whatever. Just all sorts of random cool covers, but they're Gospels of John. You can get those. I think they're free. You can order a bunch for free. And leave those with a tip or give those to someone like this guy Tom did. Look, look at this guy's story. He, so he, just a little gospel of John. I gave a pocket gospel to a military veteran who did not believe in Christ. When he asked me why I, was always, I always seemed happy, even in bad circumstances, I said it was my belief in Christ and the hope he gives me. So he took a gospel but never talked about it. I kept him in prayer and asked God to let his word change the guy's heart. A year later, we met up again. I could see the difference in him. He had read the gospel and asked Jesus into his life, and he not only became a believer, he also led his wife and six kids to Christ. All because Tom gave him a book and said, here, this is for you. You can say those five words, right? This is for you here, for here, this is for you. Try it. Practice right now. Ready? One, two, three. Here, this is for you. See your pros already. So easy. People at home, I hope you did that too. Um, try it. It's that easy. Invitational style. Invitational evangelism. It's a beautiful thing. You could even do what both Tom and the lady in the story did and pair your testimonial, your story, with invitational, right? Here's how Jesus changed my life. Why don't you come to our church? Why don't you come listen to it with me? I mean, it worked pretty good in her case, right? The whole town ended up believing in Jesus. 
Who's to say the same thing couldn't happen with your coworkers or your classmates or, you know, your street or your school as God uses you? Oh, please, Matt, come on. No, seriously, I literally just this morning read an article while Amy was getting ready online about some different statistics of people who come to church. Do you know about three to four out of ten people would say yes to an invitation to church if someone would just ask them? Three and four out of ten. It's like three and a half out of ten, basically. But you don't have a half person. Well, only half of you can come to church. No. The three to four people. If someone would just ask them. The problem is no one ever asks because we get so scared. Three out of ten. Three to four out of ten. Don't be the no one who asks. Be someone who asks and invites people to what they've been missing the whole time. You know, nothing's really changed in the human heart from since the first century. The same stuff this lady needed from Jesus is the same stuff people still need today. Um, in fact, I love how uh, Pastor Greg Laurie says it. He, ha- he has this online uh, free class you can take called Tell Someone. It's like an evangelism class. If you want kind of a bonus, I'll give you the link to it. It's free. It's six parts. Um, But I love what he says in the second part. Watch this. You know, I think it's safe to say that we can assume certain things about all people, no matter who they are, no matter how old they are or young they are, if they're men, if they're women, where they live. These things are true of every person. Number one, everyone, deep down inside, they're empty. Why is that? Well, the Bible actually says that God made his creation, that's us, subject to emptiness. You might say that we're sort of born with a hole in our heart. In fact, the Bible says God has said eternity in our hearts. We're born with this sense that there's more to life than what we're experiencing now. Everyone is empty. I'm talking about the guy cruising down the boulevard in the brand new Bentley. I'm talking about the movie star. I'm talking about the person no one has ever heard of. I'm talking about the intellectual. I'm talking about whoever, wherever. Everyone is empty deep down inside. Number two, everyone's lonely. There's a deep loneliness inside of us. And I think that's really, when you get down to it, a loneliness for God himself. That's why when people get married and even when they have children, they think that's going to fill the void in their life and it doesn't. You know, when you're single, you say, oh man, if I was married, I'd be happy. And then you get married and you'd say, oh man, if we just had children, I'd be happy. And you have children and you'd say, if we could just get rid of these children, I'd be happy. And uh, maybe I married the wrong person. If I married another person, I'd be happy. And on it goes, there's this loneliness really for God himself. Number three, everyone is guilty. We have a sense that when we do something wrong, well, it's wrong. God's built that into us. It's sort of like the fire alarm, you know? I don't know about you, but in my house, I have a smoke alarm. It always goes off at three o'clock in the morning. And usually it's because it needs a battery, never because it's smoke. Why is it always three in the morning, not three in the afternoon? But anyway, it's very sensitized. And God gives us a conscience. Now, we can harden our conscience, but we're born with a conscience, and we know that we're guilty. We feel guilt because we're guilty because we've all sinned. Here's another thing that's true of every person. Everyone is afraid to die. There's a universal fear of death. We may laugh at death, we may make jokes about death, or we may never talk about death, but deep down inside, we're aware of our mortality, and we're aware that one day this life will come to an end. Everyone is empty, everyone is lonely, everyone is guilty, and everyone is afraid to die. But here's the good news. God is a solution to all of those things. First of all, Christ can fill the void in a person's life when he himself comes and takes residence inside of them. Christ can be that forever friend that will never leave you or forsake you, as he himself said, and wherever you go in life, you know you're not alone, you know that God is with you. And Christ, of course, can forgive the sin that produces the guilt. So you get to the real issue instead of the mere symptom. And finally, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can know that you will live forever. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believes in me shall never die. Yeah, that's what we know about everyone, and we have the answer. We've got to get the gospel to people, and we need to get on with this, not hesitate, not procrastinate, but engage people. Listen, the good news is only good if it gets there on time. 
And again, if you want to do the, the whole series, it's totally free. It's online. They even give you a little certificate when you're done. I'll, I'll actually, I'll just put the link on our Facebook later if you want to do the whole thing. But um, So who could you invite this week to a golf tournament or a worship service or even just to listen to the radio with you while you're driving somewhere? Pop in a DC Talk CD. Don't play some like kids bop thing. You know, play, play like something good in hopes that ultimately it'll connect someone to the Jesus they so desperately need. Let's pray. And just for a second, with all our eyes closed, all our heads bowed, nobody looking around, can I ask you to get real with God for a moment, just you and him? You know, maybe the number one person in your life who needs Jesus right now is actually you. But you've heard the gospel. You heard it like twice today. You know what Jesus did for you. You know that God loves you so much. You know he's taken a million steps to reach you, but he leaves that last step to you. Is there any reason why you shouldn't take it this morning? And if not, all you have to do is say yes and accept his gift. Like we said at the beginning, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to impress him. It's his gift. Just like any gift, all you have to do is accept it and use it. And Jesus says you do that by repenting. What's that mean? It's a fancy word. It means make a U-turn in life. Make a decision, a point, like right here, right now, I'm going to stop living for me. I'm going to stop doing life my own way. I'm going to put my trust in Jesus and follow him. I'm going to surrender control to him. Whatever he wants for the rest of my life, that's what I want. That's what it means, repenting, a U-turn. Now, is that always easy? I guarantee it's not always easy. But I also promise it's always worth it. Besides, where else are you going to go? Really, I mean, Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through him. Other religions, other ideas, whatever yoga might offer you temporary peace, Jesus offers you constant peace. Others might offer you something if you do enough good works. Jesus shows up and says, you can't. You, you can't do enough to get to God, but I'll do it for you. Just accept my help. And if you would like to say yes to Jesus this morning and walk out of here changed forever, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. These aren't magic words. There's no formula necessarily for this. It's just a prayer of a heart. It's what's in your heart that matters most. But if you want to ask Jesus to come into your life and take over, you want to know that you're forgiven. You want to know that whenever you die, you'll be with him. And that until then, you're living a full life that he created you to have here and now you want to say yes to Jesus, then I invite you to pray this with me. I'll pray it out loud. You can just pray it silently in your heart. He can hear that. But if you want to say yes to him this morning and settle this once and for all, pray this with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Even when I went my own way. I'm sorry for all the bad I've done. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising from the dead. Please come into my life and save me and help me follow you from this day forward. And thank you. And Jesus, I pray for anyone here or watching this online that pray that for the first time or the 80th time that this would be something different. This would be the start of something new for them, that they'd realize you just forgave everything in their past and gave them a brand new start. Please wrap your arms around them, encourage them, help them know they'll never walk alone again. They never have to live an empty life again. All these things we've talked about, Jesus, it's all in you. Thank you so much. And I pray for all of us, God, that for, for all of those we could invite this week, that you'd work in their hearts and their lives, even right now, Bring them to a place where they'd be open to our invitations and accept our invitations and come, whether it's a church service or a concert or a golf tournament, whatever, ultimately they'd come to know you. They'd come to connect with you. Help us point the way. Use us to however you see fit, God. And may the may entire communities, our entire street, our entire office, wherever we spend our time, may every single one of them ultimately come to know this awesome Jesus that has changed our lives before it's too late. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.